from the atrium of the World Bank Group headquarters in Washington, D.C. Welcome to everybody joining us here in person and to those watching from around the world. I'm Noriana Fernando, and for the next hour, we will be focusing on how to best invest in our young people to help them reach their potential. The pandemic, compounded by crises stemming from conflict and climate, has erased years of human capital progress. School closures and the resulting learning losses could have lifelong negative impacts on young people. And limited employment recovery among young people may result in limited opportunities for their futures. Now, the World Bank Group is supporting countries as they prioritize investment decisions to ensure that these impacts are not permanent. Today's event brings together global leaders to discuss policy priorities that can support a sustained recovery in learning and skills development. The event will have two panel discussions, and we will also hear young voices from around the world. Here's a quick look at what's coming up. As you can see, we are in for some very interesting discussions here today as we explore how to support a sustained recovery in learning and skills development in order to restore and accelerate key human capital outcomes. Now remember, you can share your thoughts on these topics at any time using the hashtag and learning poverty. And please find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook and LinkedIn. We have experts standing by to answer all of your questions in English, Spanish, French, Arabic. They're working to answer as many questions as possible, so please do post them online at live.worldbank.org. Now, we are also inviting you to take part in a special poll. And the poll question here today is, which policy do you think is most important in addressing COVID-19 learning losses? Now, the answers we have are A, to reach every child and keep them in school, B, assess learning levels regularly, C, prioritize the teaching fundamentals, D, increase the efficiency of instruction through catch-up learning, or E, develop psychosocial health and well-being. Now, there's no right answer. Whether you're online here in the audience, you can cast your vote and live.worldbank.org, and we will have the results for you at the end of the event. So now the big question, how does a country prioritize investment decisions to ensure that the pandemic does not permanently set back education and employment outcomes? What did we learn during the pandemic that can improve learning and employment initiatives to help the most vulnerable people? Well, our guests today will be tackling those tough questions, but first, let's have a look at some of the key data to see how the pandemic has impacted learning and youth employment in developing countries. We know that children around the world lost an enormous number of days in the classroom as a result of COVID-19, which drove a large rise in learning poverty. Now, just a reminder that learning poverty measures the percentage of all children who cannot read and understand a simple text by the time they reach 10 years old. And we have new data for this measure in 2019, as well as simulations for 2022. Even before the pandemic, the world was facing a learning crisis. Now, this red line shows for low and middle income countries globally, learning poverty was already rising. And in 2019, it stood at 57%. But look at how the trajectory changes as a result of school closures and the low effectiveness of remote learning. Simulations suggest that it has now risen to 70%. Let's break that down region by region. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the region that already faced the deepest learning crisis, recent progress on reducing learning poverty has been reversed by the pandemic. Latin America and the Caribbean, South Asia, the Middle East and North Africa, all facing learning poverty rates between 50 and 65 percent before the outbreak show even bigger increases. The simulations for East Asia and the Pacific, as well as Europe and Central Asia, while at a lower level, also show significant increases. 
Due to this shock to education, millions more children in low and middle income countries are now in learning poverty, unable to read a simple text by age 10. Pre-pandemic learning poverty targets are now out of reach. And the learning losses don't stop in school. Young people in training and in jobs have also been affected. It is estimated that more than one in six young people stopped work due to the pandemic. And more than one billion young people have had their education and training opportunities interrupted. Without remediation, this generation of students now risks losing $21 trillion in potential lifetime earnings. That's equivalent to a reduction of 10%. Decades of learning and of economic and social gains are at risk. But urgent action can help reverse these losses and help future generations of children and young people reach their full potential. Manawuna, I am Dia from Madagascar and you're watching the World Bank Group IMF annual meetings. Our first discussion today is on how we can overcome this learning crisis. We are joined now by David Malpass, president of the World Bank Group, who will moderate this conversation. He is joined by Catherine Russell, executive director of UNICEF, an organization that is a strong advocate for foundational learning. Also here today is the Honorable Samuel D. Tway Jr., Minister of Finance and Development Planning for Liberia, a country that is making it a priority to invest in the early years to get maximum return on human capital. And also joining us today is Shafi Khan, president and founding partner of Teach the World Foundation, which is harnessing technology to help tackle the learning crisis. David, over to you. Thank you. Well, we're here today uh, because this truly is a crisis, a learning crisis. So we want to talk about both the crisis and the, the, the solutions. Um, one thing, uh, as I think about it, it co the costs are gigantic, economic, health, and moral imperative for, for, uh, to improve the education systems uh, around the world. We, the COVID has uh, struck a hard blow, uh, and what we're, we are trying to do is set the principles for getting people back in school, having them funded, uh, create foundational learning experiences that actually can carry the children forward uh, into the future. We know the tools exist, and we'll uh, speak about some of that. And the organizations exist. The World Bank is a, the, a major external funder of education. Catherine Russell and UNICEF are a major uh, funder. And we know that the, the technology and the techniques exist. So let's, let's go into that mm -hmm. with the knowledge that this is the right direction for the the world. So I, I want to start start with Catherine Russell of, of UNICEF. Um, let me set the context. Learning uh, learning losses are huge. Yep. Give us give us some sense of the magnitude of the problem mm -hmm. and how you're approaching it. Thank yeah. you. Well, thank you, President Malpass, and, and thank you so much for, for doing this because I think bringing attention to this issue is critically important. And I feel like we have a little bit of a moment in time where the world is focused on education. We had a summit at the UN uh, uh, two weeks ago, and I think world leaders are understanding how challenging it is. So for UNICEF, you know, we work in virtually every country in the world. Uh, before COVID, we estimated that about half of 10-year-olds in low and middle income countries couldn't read a simple sentence or do simple math problems. COVID exacerbated that so dramatically. So now we're estimating about 70% of children overall age 10 cannot read a sentence. So think about what that means for their futures, right? They don't have the basic tools to be educated. So what we're hoping is that with the attention of the world, with the work of the World Bank, the work of UNICEF and our partners, we can address this crisis before it's a full-blown catastrophe and we lose this whole generation of children. Yeah, um, it's it's huge. That that conference in New York was was telling because there was such a cohesion of the group mm -hmm. uh, around what the problem is and what the solutions and directions are. Mm -hmm. And so, getting the world moving in that direction. One of the cores that we work on is helping governments realize that they have to reestablish the funding for education mm -hmm. and focus it on foundational learning. Yeah. And so, we're, we're we are uh, actively trying to have programs in that direction. Yeah. 
and working with UNICEF. I wonder if I can ask Minister Twee, so you're the finance minister, so I want to put you on the hook a little bit. <laughs> are you providing enough funding for education, and how, what are the main challenges within Liberia, and maybe speak more broadly, if you'd like, about West Africa in terms of uh, the challenges? Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you for being on the panel. Um, you know, COVID is a challenge that is ravaging the world or has ravaged part of the world. But I think it's also important to see it as an opportunity. You know, yesterday I was on a panel talking about fertilizer. Today we're talking about education. Mm -hmm. The crisis, the pandemic has given us the opportunity to put education and many of the difficult sectors in, into a stock shop relief. So countries that were underfunding education are now in the hot seat. So mm -hmm. you're putting me in the hot seat saying, okay, what have you been doing for COVID? So before COVID, what have we been doing for education? When we look post-COVID and see the challenges, we're like, wow, we, we probably haven't been doing too much. Our circumstance in Liberia is difficult because we came from war. So, mm -hmm. for example, in the last nearly nine or 10 years, uh, the share of education, the share of education, education as a share of the budget has averaged 14%. So that leaves us a 6% gap to get to 20%. No country can do any serious thing in education without spending at least 20%. We know that. Mm -hmm. But the challenges have been so grave in physical infrastructure, electricity, that you have to ration the resources. Well, the, your report has just highlighted that um, human capital is a serious challenge. It's not just an educational challenge, it's, a, it's an economic challenge because if we don't invest adequately, we compromise the future of today's generation. Mm -hmm. And so this is the opportunity that COVID now brings to say, okay, what can we do differently? Uh, we've been able to manage fiscal, uh, to, uh, to, to mobilize some additional fiscal space in Liberia, especially in the last two years. We've increased domestic resource by about 125 million. That's huge. Before that, we didn't have this 125 million. In the short term, it's challenging because we have to pay for elections next year. We have to do some infrastructure. But I can see how, in the medium term, we have $100 million to reallocate in the post-COVID, post-Ukraine context <coughs> to critical investment in, in education. For example, working with partners like UNICEF, the Global Partnership for Education, and the World Bank, the country now has a new plan, which is looking at spending $967 million to transform education in Liberia. The government, both the executive, the legislature are committed to this plan. So what we're looking at, government's contribution should be around 60%. That's nearly around 580 million. How do we get there? Because of the increased uh, resources that we now have, if we devoted the additional 6%, that adds up to around 46 million annually, on top of what we've been doing on the average over the last six, 10 years, we can get there. Now, I don't have the pay grade to commit that here at Minister of Finance. <laughs> But, but, but the general commitment of the government is to support this new plan. The plan builds on learning losses, lessons from, from COVID-19. In Liberia, we've lost around 35, I think, uh, six, uh, 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 five to six months of learning. That's what the Minister of Education tells me. And they've been trying to, they, during the COVID, they tried to, to do some learning programs, radio, but it was successful by around 35, 40%, yeah. so that. But working with GPE, what they've done is that they've built an infrastructure so that if the next pandemic happens, 95% of Liberia students will get education through that radio. So this mm -hmm. is how partnership is working across, uh, across the country. And I know this is true mm -hmm. for many countries in the West African region. Mm -hmm. Let's see COVID as a challenge, but let's also see it as an opportunity to rethink, reestablish financing, reestablish modality, and I think that's where we're going. Very good. Thank, thank you. Well, we'll, I want to come back to the specifics in, within that as well. Shafiq Khan, uh, you had Teach for America. You were a, a founder and president. Uh, tell us about that. How can technology help with this? And what would you do in pick any country? What, what programs are really working in your view? So Teach the World Foundation. Teach the World Foundation, Very sorry. Modest what, day. I'm not oh. sure what. Teach, for the, <laughs> teach the World Foundation. Yes. Sorry. So we are in three countries, in Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Malawi. And first, I'm honored to be here with this group. And it's wonderful to see a finance minister talking about education, mm -hmm. because that's what we need to have yes. happen everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I'm also very appreciative of the fact that you are shining a light both on the crisis but also on the opportunity and that every one of us sees it that way. So what we're doing is basically looking at digital transformation as a massive, massive opportunity to change education for good. And our perspective is uh, also, given our background, my background is in digital transformation. Uh, we've seen what's happened over the last three decades in digital transformation of all industries, pretty much our lives, and so on. At this point, it has not really hit education. And one of the things we are trying to do is make sure that happens. So in that scheme, uh, we've launched a number of programs. Uh, we have what you were referring to, David, as the school in the box. So we have actually a model called the digital micro school, where we'll go into an area that has a lot of out-of-school children, uh, potentially a slum, could be a refugee camp, uh, could be a remote Himalayan outpost. And basically, we get a room, uh, get 25 tablets, which have some of the world's best educational games on them. In fact, we do have one of our partners here who has one of the world's best education games that we use. And we end up uh, basically teaching them uh, in a digital mode. The, the results of this have been just absolutely outstanding. Uh, we didn't expect the results to be as good as they are. Uh, frankly, in our case, uh, I would have been happy if uh, our out-of-school kids who would not have had any education at all could have done half as well as they did. But the actual reality was that they did one and a half times better than children. Is it equal girls and boys as far as that result? Uh, so our commitment is that our class should be both genders but is equally. But is the uh, success rate the yeah. same? Actually, actually, the success rate for girls and boys is very similar. Similar. Uh -huh. uh, there's really no appreciable difference. C Catherine, I know one of your, so as you think about foundational learning, that's really important. And how do you get there quickly? So the yeah. REACH program, could you describe that? Yeah, I think the, the concept for us is, we, as I said, we have this moment. If we have support of leaders in countries, finance ministers, I agree, are absolutely key. Uh, we need political commitment to try to address this. And then we know what to do. And we need the support of the bank and others. But the idea is, number one, you have to find these children. Because a lot of them have left school because of COVID. And many, many millions are not coming back. And that's a special issue for girls. Girls. A lot of girls were married uh, off during this time. Uh, a lot of children, boys and girls, went into the market, into the uh, job market. They're not coming back to the schools. So we're trying to get as many back as we can. Then we have to assess where they are. And if you think about it, you know, you, you, you were 10 years old when, this, when COVID hit. You're out of school for one year, maybe two years. You come back, what grade do you go in? You know, what do they do with you? you, you you're older. You know, are you, are you fitting? into the right group and because that can be a real issue for children because they can just give up even so even if we get them back they can say this is so discouraging I can't learn so we know what to do we assess them we have a process where we can teach them fundamentals quickly and so that means training the teachers to do that having the commitment of the, the communities and then we can keep them there because once they get the fundamental learning then they can do everything else and technology yeah. can play a big part in that for sure but there are many children who don't have access to technology, and we still know how to do it. We still know how right. to get them up to speed. And I think the key is really the, the political commitment from leaders to say this is a priority, because if not, our country's really in dire straits. Minister Tweet, uh, have, do you talk with other finance ministers about this? Do, do, I, I know they have, they each has a lot of problems nowadays, whether it's the rising interest rates or climate change or on down the list. But do they talk about education as being important? And this, this very important point that Catherine's mentioning of that teachers have to be allowed to teach to the level of the student or encouraged uh, to teach to the level of the student because there's been so much backsliding. 
What do you think? Look, definitely, you know, education has a challenge that I can term as, a, as an invisibility challenge. And I think that's the same debate amongst economists. The role of human capital. You know, quite lately, I think, in the 1950s, economists recognized that human capital is critical for transformation. Mm -hmm. So we think about land, physical capital, machines. It's the same kind of thing happening in, in political economies. Mm -hmm. People see roads. People see yeah. transmission mm -hmm. lines. Mm -hmm. There is no tangible, quantifiable way to say, oh, yeah. students are not performing, and I see that. Mm -hmm. People have to be made aware of that constantly. Mm -hmm. And so that's a, that's a visibility challenge, that's a communications challenge. In the post-COVID era, we need to develop strategies to bring policy makers to that awareness that human capital today is as fundamentally important as electricity infrastructure. We're still not there. So finance ministers are thinking more in terms of things that they see, right? and less about things that they really don't see. Because returns on capital will not happen in one year. That's a challenge. Return on education is going to happen in a decade. You're going to see that. But in that slower, it obtrudes beyond political cycles. Governments are elected for two-year yeah. term. They may not be in office to see the return. So we, to get them to think generationally requires an innovative approach. And I think that's where we're going. In terms of teachers, look, you know, teachers are indispensable. We have a large teacher gap right now in Liberia. Mm -hmm. We need about 6,000 more teachers in our schools. To fund them requires an extraordinary amount of money, $45, $40 million a year. Now, I've just committed, not committed, I'm just proposing to commit to, because I want to be careful how I speak, but let's say Liberia comes over $50 million additional. Are we going to spend that on closing the teacher gap? Is that where the return is going to happen? Or are we going to find a way and solve some of that problem? So you see the challenge. So the teacher, the teacher skilling problem, girls' education, I think, has to be prioritized more than it is currently. Uh, about half of the girls before COVID, this is before COVID, were dropping out of secondary school in Liberia, and that's a scary statistic. Mm -hmm. We want to turn that around. Sure. COVID has exacerbated that enrollment rate. Mm -hmm. All right? And so it's just for me an opportunity to really bring this to legislators and to policymakers in a way. Now, coming out of here, I, at least I have the, the pedigree to go to my legislators and say, look, I was on the panel with the World Bank president, you know, and I made a case for Liberia. The argument is that we have to invest more, and the president's already willing to do that. I can tell you one thing. I don't know about next year where we're spending a lot, but take a look at 2024 numbers in Liberia. You're going to see a dramatic difference in the size of the investment in education. Yeah, exactly right. And I, Mom Timurti is here, and we can t talk with her about more money for Liberia. But um, I wanted to also say that, you know, the demographic challenge is huge. Uh, some, some of the countries have so many really young kids that will soon be in primary school and then in secondary school. Shafiq, if you had $50 million in Liberia, how would you advise uh, spending it? So <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to put each, all of us on the spot. Um, do, parents have to be involved. You mentioned tablets, and those yeah. cost money. Make, make the case, isn't it most important to have teachers that, are, that understand the curriculum and can really teach to the, to the students? Yes, uh, there, is, there is no question that if you have teachers, if you have good teachers, that is the best way to go. In fact, the best model of teaching in the world is the Plato to Aristotle to Alexander the Great model. The only problem is you don't have a lot of Plato's, you don't have a lot of Aristotle's. Mm -hmm. It's not a scalable model. Mm -hmm. And in the case of yeah. the situation uh, that the Honorable Finance Minister has, as does Pakistan, as do many of these countries, the single biggest problem is there aren't enough teachers, so you've got to do something about that. And right now, technology is a major enabler. Yeah. At the same time, if there are teachers, unfortunately, in most of the developing world, there's so little accountability of teachers for outcomes that at the end of the day, they end up not really teaching well enough. And as we've said before, as Catherine just said, most sixth graders 
or eighth graders, I think you said, cannot read a sentence of text. I mean, that's the situation we are in. Now, when we look at the technology that we've been using, uh, these kids, sometimes in 90 days, can begin to read and write. And the motivation that comes from the format that we use, which is educational games, at the end of the day, we all have to believe that engagement is one of the most important things. And educational games and the format we have allows us to get massive engagement and thus uh, and, great learning. And does that mean do you, do you make progress with fewer teachers per student? So we would, we would in the case of Liberia, for instance, uh -huh, so 6, we had 000, 50, 50 million. Uh, I would focus first on the out-of-school kids because there'll be kids out of school because they don't have teachers. If you're short 6,000 teachers, that's you're in very good, very good shape. Most countries have hundreds of thousands of teachers short. Pakistan would be mm -hmm. 500 to 700,000 short. Uh, so I'd focus on those with the tech. And, and in our situation, technology becomes an enabler yeah. for a less trained teacher. Mm -hmm. So I'd do that. The second thing I would do is, uh, I don't know what your situation is in terms of quality of education, but I have to think that it's probably not that different That's from cool. other developing countries. So the quality when you teach the poorest of the poor mm -hmm. with the best software in the world is just uh, I mean, mind-boggling. And that's the kind of thing I would invest in. Teach for the World Foundation. Uh, and so, Catherine, maybe last word to yeah. you, and then I, that we're gonna, going to be uh, moved off of here, I'm afraid. Um, you, it, thoughts on what we haven't discussed? Any um, new topics? Where do we go from here? I, I think that the key is that we have, to, we have to seize the moment. We can't let this moment go, or we will really uh, pay the price for it down the road. And I, I would just stress that for us, we, we know how to teach these children the very basic thing, and we know how to train others to teach them, too. And I think that we have to stay very focused on the foundational learning. We've got to get these children to the point where they can read simple sentences, do simple computations. Otherwise, they are lost. And that means such a tragedy for them and for their communities, their countries, and ultimately the world. And we cannot miss this opportunity. That, that's very well said. Can, I, I'll, I'll close with a general point. Um, as, as we look at developing countries, we try to connect people in the countries with NGOs, with, uh, with UN agencies, with, uh, with vital uh, knowledge centers. Uh, and so as people in the audience see opportunities, and I, I, Catherine and I discussed this prior, where there can be a better program in a country or where there's a program that's not working, that, uh, 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 that there would be a better way to go. Um, we, I think there needs to be dialogue to try to cause the programs to change faster mm -hmm. toward the technology that works, the funding sources, the, the, the teachers that work, reopening the schools. If, if, and so I hope people will speak up in country mm -hmm. uh, through, you know, we talk about country platforms, but what that means is people meeting within the country with knowledgeable uh, deci decision makers. I, I hope the, you, the finance minister will chair a little meeting in Liberia where people talk about What's the best way to fund more teachers uh, and, and so on? Thank you, everybody. This was really great. Thanks, panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. And thank you to our distinguished panelists for those powerful key messages. And thank you all for joining us. Now, don't go anywhere. We got our next panel coming up. But before that, the impacts of COVID-19 on learning and youth employment were felt around the world. We heard about every region's numbers. Let's hear now from young people who were affected and take a look at some of the initiatives underway to recapture lost learning and prepare young people for their futures. Bueno, el primer día después que ya se declaró la pandemia fue fue como un cachetazo en realidad al sistema educativo. Como ya la pandemia, fueron las clases virtuales y nosotros no, no teníamos señal ni tampoco el dinero para poner internet para yo estudiar. En las clases virtuales, si teníamos una duda, 
y el profesor no nos veía, no nos escuchaba, no pues, nos pues, tendríamos que quedar con la duda. Encontré con chicos que ya se habían olvidado de una tabla de multiplicar sabiendo que están en una edad de 14 a 18 años. Entonces es un rezago totalmente educativo. Después de dos años recién nos estamos dando cuenta cómo fue la reacción de ellos. Nos ha dado un poco luces de cómo ha ido afectando a los chiquillos. Hoy día chiquillos súper introvertidos, asustadizos en los liceos, tienen eh, pocas eh, posibilidades de interactuar también con sus compañeros. I want to be an engineer. Chúng tôi cũng có những sự cố kết hợp đặc biệt với các trường cao đẳng đại học trên địa bàn thành phố trong cái các cái hoạt động về tư vấn đối tượng sinh viên chuẩn bị tham gia vào thị trường lao động. Đấy, chúng tôi hướng đến việc là tư vấn về các cái kỹ năng, ví dụ như những kỹ năng tham gia phỏng vấn, những cái kỹ năng mềm khác nữa. Trước kia thì mình sẽ không nghĩ là mình theo đuổi ngành kỹ thuật đâu Một cái ngành mà đặc thù thường là con trai theo học ấy Bởi vì mình nghĩ nó khá là khô khan Suốt ngày chỉ vùi đầu vào máy móc và các bản thiết kế Nhưng mà trong quá trình tìm hiểu thì mình thấy là thị trường của ngành hàng không đang rất là phát triển Và nó tạo ra những cái cơ hội triển vọng việc làm cho sinh viên Assalamu alaikum. I'm Aslam from Islamabad, Pakistan, and you are watching the World Bank Group IMF Annual Meeting. Our next discussion is on a very important topic, jobs and skills for young people. We're joined now by Mari Pangestu, Managing Director for Development Policy and Partnerships at the World Bank Group, who will moderate the conversation. Mari is joined by His Excellency Dr. Mohammed Al Jasser, Chairman of the Islamic Development Bank Group, which is supporting member states as they address youth skills and employment challenges. Dr. Betty Vandenbosch, the Chief Content Officer at Coursera, an online learning platform used by millions around the world. And Augustine Mayalbi, the Deputy Director at Kenya's Ministry of ICT, Innovation and Youth Affairs. He's also the National Project Coordinator for the Kenya Youth Employment and Opportunities Project. Mari, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. It's very exciting to be in this uh, atrium uh, for this uh, event. Uh, as uh, was already mentioned, today we're going to be talking about how to uh, restore skills uh, and employability of our youth, given the impact of given the impact that COVID has had uh, on our youth. Uh, I think there were lots of numbers presented at the beginning uh, of this uh, session. Uh, and basically, our jobs report shows that a larger number of youth stopped working uh, because of COVID. And there was a number I saw, one out of six uh, youth stopped working. That was an ILO uh, number. Uh, second, a lot more youth are working in the informal sector. And third, a number from our jobs report is showing that youth are taking much longer uh, to get jobs. So these are all uh, numbers that, that we need to be uh, conscious of as to the seriousness uh, of the crisis. And you can see youth unemployment uh, rising and being very high uh, in many of the countries uh, that we work in. 
So uh, let me uh, uh, turn to our very distinguished panel here to help us uh, with this uh, very important discussion. Let me first turn to you, uh, Dr. Uh, Al Ajazer, uh, and I'd like to start with a big picture question uh, for you. Uh, uh, what you are seeing as the key challenges facing young people in terms of skills and employability, and what can be done uh, about it? <coughs> well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as we all know, the pandemic has exacerbated the issue of youth unemployment tremendously in most of the countries. This impact is strongly felt in the Islamic Development Bank groups membership, specifically those in fragile contexts. Often, Many of them have under, undiversified economic structures, often relying on primary commodity exports, which have been severely affected by supply chain disruptions. The Islamic Development Bank member countries also face investment risks due to potential rating downgrades and capital flight, which is detrimental to investment flows. Building a post-COVID system now more than ever, will entail the ability to enact more sustainable public policies focusing on equity and inclusiveness, particularly job creation and women and youth empowerment. There are multiple factors influencing youth employability. First is the relevance of skills in a digital era. Indeed, the COVID-19 pandemic has increased awareness about the importance of digital technologies. Hence, we need to improve education policies to ensure that demand-driven approaches are adopted and supply relevant skills to youth in schools or vocational training. We, would also, we should also strive to predict the future and the skills needed to create a future-proof generation so we do not have to go back and reskill them but focus on continuous upskilling instead. The second factor is the availability of jobs in the market. For this reason, we should assist our countries in growing their economies by investing, for example, in broadband connectivity. Indeed, digital technology has the potential to create new jobs and help boost the productivity of existing ones. Again, this will primarily benefit women and young people. The question is how we can turn those wishes into opportunities for economic growth and increased employment. To address this, we at the Islamic Development Bank have up updated our strategy to align with our country's needs, especially under the current situation. We focus on boosting recovery post the pandemic driving green economic growth and building resilience and fighting poverty. Digital inclusion is one of the flagship initiatives of our realigned strategy. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for emphasizing the importance of vocational learning, uh, upskilling, uh, and job creation, uh, especially in the digital sector. So this is a good segue for you um, uh, to uh, Betty to uh, see how, how the interrupted learning that we have seen with the youth. Uh, I think the number that we saw earlier was that one billion youth had interrupted uh, learning or, or training uh, during the pandemic. So uh, what is the role of uh, digital learning platforms? Uh, can we effectively provide students with the right skills for today as well as for tomorrow? And uh, Dr. Yasser was identifying the tomorrow, which is you know, more digital and green jobs, for instance. So, of course, it's always really, really difficult to predict tomorrow. <laughs> However, I think for today, it's very, very clear that digital skills, data, technology, um, big business, are the skills that our youth need. And fortunately, it's easier to learn those skills online than many other skills. The wonder of online technology is that when you're using online to learn how to create online, you've got a, a wonderful connection. 
And we have found that this is working marvelously through the pandemic. We've done a study with the IFC and the European Union with women in the developing world that found that many, many women are taking advantage of online education mm. because they can. Mm. It's uh, less risky for them. It gives them more flexibility. It enables them to do a little bit of learning so they can get a bit better job, do a little bit more and a little bit more. And we find that introductory certificates, certificates that teach you the basic skills that enable you to get your first job are a wonderful way for our youth and even some who are not so young mm. to move into the jobs of today and hopefully tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you so much. So it's learning for today as well as lifelong yeah, learning, right. always the upskilling part uh, of your right. point earlier. Uh, now let's turn to Augustine. Uh, we know that in many countries, particularly in lower and middle income countries, informal self-employment, and our jobs numbers show that, remains prevalent uh, a type of work for most young people and also especially for women. What initiatives uh, can be taken to strengthen the skills, productivity, and resilience of informal and self-employed uh, women and youth? Thank you, Director, and uh, good morning, all wonderful people. As mentioned, uh, my name is uh, Gustin Mayabi, the National Project Coordinator for KEOP. KEOP stands for Kenya Youth Employment Opportunities Project in Kenya. Uh, what you said, Madam, is uh, right and uh, true quite a big segment of our youth find themselves in the informal and self-employment. And as we speak today, the issue of unemployment is as old as mankind. And unless we sort it out in a proper way, we are bound to have the same problems that we are having in the world today. So I want to say one of the initiatives, basically because of time, one of the initiatives that uh, we can put in place is investing in skills development. What do I mean here? We ensure that the formal training we do, the classroom training, work hand in hand with the skills. So that when a trainee or a learner finishes school, he already has the skills. I'm talking about creative skills, critical thinking skills, problem solving skills, skills which can enable any learner, even if he drops out along the way, is able to get employment. That's one of the initiatives. The second initiative, is inclusivity of all stakeholders. And here I mean the private sector, the public, the employers, the educational planners, and even those in tertiary institutions must come together to forecast skills. Don't we forecast weather? weather sorry. We say it will rain, it will be dry, it will be windy, and therefore we plan. So we also need to plan for education which skills will we require in the coming three or four years? We had COVID, it's gone. We might have another pandemic. Have we planned for that pandemic? So we need to do like weathermen to forecast the skills we require. In this era, if we are thinking of even preparing a curriculum and then we bring it to school, but we have not changed our training in universities, means we will not have any change in our society, any meaningful change. So what I would say is that inclusivity of all stakeholders for them to think together, decide which type of curriculum we need, which type of skills are on demand the job market will be a cure to the issue we are facing right now. The third issue is reskilling, skilling and reskilling. Those who, who are employed have certain skills, but as the world keeps on changing, do we give them new skills? So there is need to reskill. Even the youth who are informal and self-employment, some of them could not have gone to school, they have no formal training, they need skills because they end up in vulnerable jobs. So we have to reskill and give them skills that will enable them to run their businesses and wherever they are employed to make those skills make them more employable. So there is need to reskill. The other issue that we'll handle is the issue of productivity. How do we increase productivity among those youth who are informal in self-employment? We need to have affirmative programs. In Kenya, we have a program known as AGPO, which is Access to Government Procurement Opportunities which means trading with the government, 30% is set aside for youth, women, and persons living with disabilities. This enables them to do business with the government. They can do tendering, they're trained how to, to get the tenders, how to form companies, and how to be able to tender for those businesses and run them. 
The fourth one will be to have affirmative funds for these people who are vulnerable, the youth. In Kenya, we have a fund known as Youth Fund. We have Women Fund. We have Oweso Fund. All these funds are geared towards helping the youth to access loans because they have no chattels, they have no security, which otherwise they can get a loan from the bank. So this part of the programs that we are able to put in place. And then lastly, I want to say, in terms of skills development, it's important also to take care of a segment in our societies that are vulnerable, that never went through formal schooling, that never went through tertiary education, but they are there. They end up in vulnerable jobs. But they perpetuate the same poverty, whatever they earn is small. So there is need for a project that, like the one I mentioned in KOP, sponsored by the World Bank, that has taken care of this youth, just to equip them with skills that can enable them to be employable. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and I really like the fact that it, the program has this affirmative action part, which is women, youth, and people with disabilities. I think that's really great. And thank you for sharing the experience of Kenya, which really shows the wide range of uh, issues that you need to address from skilling, upskilling, reskilling, and entrepreneurship and uh, the importance of cooperation with private sector, which I would like to also now turn uh, that question to you, uh, Dr. Al Jazeera, uh, uh, you know, because when you look at uh, the, both the supply and the demand side uh, of the labor market, uh, really we have to look uh, to the private sector to make sure that the, we are uh, creating the right skills for the right jobs, uh, and that will be beneficial for the youth. So uh, what are your views uh, on that? Well. The private sector provides nine out of every ten jobs in developing countries. So, oh, okay, so the microphone wasn't working. Okay. <laughs> I was wondering why did he give me this? <laughs> it was a toy. No. So, uh, therefore, governments should continuously work on business environment improvements, infrastructure investments, and supportive trade policies for the private sector to generate more jobs. Also, public policies should support private sector financing through blended financing structures and public-private partnership investments. Of course, they should avoid overcrowding uh, private sector. Some governments in our member countries are also trying to de-risk the lending process. So banks will be encouraged to lend youth seed money for their enterprises. For example, banks lend youth if they pass specific training courses related to financial literacy and management. In return, government work with NGOs and their specialized entities to provide these courses for youth for free. Moreover, youth require, requires more interventions and training to acquire relevant job skills. The government can work with the private sector to provide affordable training and to reach out to disadvantaged youth, which the private sector may find profitable, especially when blended with development or philanthropic capital. Governments should play the role of a mediator, not a barrier, but a mediator between the demand and the supply sides in the skills market. Moreover, they should show the firm the firms, the benefits they can get as private gains if they invest in youth. Finally, they should guide and direct private capital flows to better serve youth education and entrepreneurship. And I, just if I could say one final point, two weeks ago I was in Jordan and I visited some schools with that UNICEF and the Islamic Development Bank and others have put in money to help young people stay off the street after school because they're vulnerable. Mm. And that has made a big difference in terms of their acquisition of skills mm. and then going into the market. Some of them have become employed because of these programs. Mm -hmm. And we visited a vocational university called uh, Lum uh, uh, Luminsk, 85 to 95 percent of those who take applied courses there get hired before they finish. Mm. And these are the types of examples that governments should focus on. First, learn from their experience, and second, support them because mm. they are 
producing people who get jobs immediately. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, now over to you, uh, Betty. Young people are trying to navigate uh, the vast market of digital learning. Uh, what advice would you give them so they can focus on the right tri type of training that will make them employable? So this is a really hard question because, of course, the answer is different for every learner. The most important thing is to recognize that you are learning so that you can earn. But at the same time, you have to love what you're doing. And I really recommend that folks try things out. For example, on Coursera, everything, most everything, is free. So you can try a little bit. And does it suit you? Is it the kind of thing you can imagine working at for a long period of time? Mm -hmm. Try a few, decide which you like. Somebody will prefer project management. Someone else will prefer data analysis. A third person is probably more creative, will want to be a user experience designer. All of those are great jobs once you've learned. But the second thing is you actually have to learn. I think that <laughs> many of you think, well, I'll just do this, and it will somehow automatically come to me. Mm -hmm. But learning is hard, mm -hmm. and it takes time. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to spend the time, not just a couple of hours every couple of weeks, but several times every single week. Mm. And the third thing that I think is really, really important is to make sure that you're learning from a quality provider of education mm. so that when you finished, you have something that you can pre present to a pre pre uh, sorry that you can present to an employer that says, yes, this is high quality and I finished it. A, a good company name, a great university name will help. And then finally, build a community. It's mm. really hard to learn by yourself. Mm. Much better to learn with mm. others who are moving forward with you. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean you have to go to a place. You can develop relationships mm. online. We all know that we've done a lot of that mm. in the last few years. Yeah. And our, our youth have done it as well. Keep up those skills, and there's no question that you can get to where you need to go so that you are learning to earn. Thank you. Learning to earn. I like that. Uh, and I think your point earlier about how women, you had an, uh, yes. you know, found women uh, doing a lot more uh, on platform, uh, using digital platform, and uh, taking STEM, STEM classes. Yeah, what's yeah, happening that's, I think is, that's really great. Yeah. Yeah. Women have found out during the pandemic that many of the jobs they had disappeared. Mm. And they still need to work, but they also need to care for their families, mm. and they need to stay safe. Mm -hmm. And online learning enables all of those things, and women are really smart. At least that's what I think. <laughs> they know... No, no bias the, opinion here. No bias at all. <laughs> they know to go to the digital jobs. <laughs> okay, over to you, Augustine. The World Bank is supporting the innovative program that you lead, uh, the Kenya Youth Employment Opportunities Project which includes engagement with private providers to improve youth uh, employability. What, if you can just very briefly share some of the key lessons learned uh, so that other countries can learn. Thank you. So as I mentioned earlier, KOP is Kenya Youth Employment Opportunities Project. This is a project for the government of Kenya, but sponsored with the World Bank, the tune of uh, uh, around 150 million USD. The project objective is to create employment opportunities for youth, and increase their earning opportunities. That's basically what the project does. <clears throat> now, who are the target? The target are youth aged between 18 and 29 years. Those who've undergone formal education and those who've not done. So I mean from zero education up to form four. Those who've gone to college are not part of this segment. So this project has four components, briefly. One component is known as training and internship. Second component is known as business startup. The third component is business labor market information system. And the fourth one is about youth policy development. So what do we do? We advertise for youths to apply using the criteria I've told you. From zero education to form four, they apply. We randomize them. 
because normally, because of unemployment, many apply. So the number we want, we are able to randomize half male, half female, 5% people with disabilities. We put them in the program. Briefly, we give them life skills training for two weeks. Remember, these are zero education form four. To put them together, you must take them through a training of life skills, survival skills, issues to do with creative thinking, issues of hygiene, self-esteem. Then after that, we again take them through another two weeks of core business skills. Just to give them the knowledge of running a business, entrepreneurship, how to support business opportunities. And after the four weeks, we now place them under master craftsmen. Master craftsmen are those local fundies or local apprenticeship people in the village, a carpenter, masonry, beauty therapy. So we attach them to those trainers in the local areas so that they are trained for a period of five months, after which they are given an examination, which they do, and they get certificates. Now, because of time, I want to mention the lessons. Lesson number one, a big segment of our youth who've never gone through any formal training have been left out. This is the group we target. That this group, even with formal or no formal education, can also receive skills and be employable. That's lesson number one. So we don't have to condemn them. Even if they're informal, in the private sector, they need skills to make their lives more sustaining so that they can get decent jobs. Number two, with those skills, through a program of the bank, we are able to give them some seed money of around $400. These skills or these funds have been able to give this youth running enterprises that are sustainable today. And I want to share with you today a success story, as she had mentioned. This group that has undergone internship and training in Kenya, the target was 70,000 youth. As we speak today, those who did internship and training, 86% are in employment. Those who gave seed money, 88% of them are in employment. Just to share with you how this skills training and seed money can do wonders. Number two, this is a typical example of how the private sector working with the government can do wonders. What do we do? After we've selected the youth through randomization, we do induction, we hand them to the private sector who do uh, life skills training, core business skills training, and then job specific skills training. Mm. So this is a typical example of different players coming together to have a program succeed. Three, that we also, this program takes care of the gender parity. Remember I've said we randomize because we'll be looking for 10,000, but because of the issue of unemployment, 200,000 apply. So we order our computer to randomize, give us 5,000 men, 5,000 women, 5% 5, 5 people living with disabilities. So this helps us in being able to sort out the gender parity issue. And you know, in any society, that moves together for both male and female, it's bound to grow economically. Societies where one gender is left behind does not grow. The fourth item is 5% is given to people with disabilities. So we are able to defeat the retrogressive cultural practices in our society where we are able to bring all, even people with disabilities, and they are given aiders, they are given caretakers, and I want to share with you, those with hearing impairment are given brails those who cannot, who have speech problem, are given sign language interpreters to help them. For the young girls who have kids, for those master craftsmen who take care of those kids, they are given some allowance to facilitate them to ensure that these young girls are able to go through the training. And during the training, the youth get a small stipend. You know, if you were to ask youth to go for, for training without facilitating, so they receive a small stipend, of around $60 a month just to help them in moving from one place to another. So this is a typical example that you can share to see how this program has done wonders to the youth. And if you allow me, Chair, we'll just I mention the last one. <laughs> we have a Future Bora program. Future Bora takes care of hard to serve, hard to reach youth. Those in the dump sites, the street youth, they are involved in a program whereby we establish bypark centers that provides them with the places where they can sell whatever they pick from those dam sites, sell. Wiley, we provide kindergartens for their children to be able to go to school so that we don't perpetuate the same disease we had. 
Thank you, Augustine. I let you go a little bit longer because I think the lessons learned uh, are very important. Uh, and congratulations with the 86% success. But I think one thing you mentioned is very important: uh, teaching them not just the uh, you know uh, technical skills, but the life skills, yes, yes. Uh, and getting to the uh, hard to reach uh, groups is, I think, very important. So let me conclude uh, this session. I'm sorry I went a little bit over time. Uh, but uh, we, I think we've had a really a great discussion. Uh, we'll take away learn to earn <laughs> uh, and the importance of public-private partnerships. I think both uh, Dr. Al Jazeera and Agustin emphasized this because the, no matter how much training you do, you know, government pol governments are always doing all kinds of training and reskilling, but it's useless if it's they cannot get a job. Uh, so it's jobs as well as entrepreneurship. Uh, I think uh, the seed money uh, program was also very important. So uh, let me stop uh, with that uh, and hand it back to you. Thank you so much, Mari, and thank you to our panelists. While you were having this excellent discussion on stage, our audience has been posting some excellent questions. Let's bring one of them to this stage. One viewer is asking, how can we upskill the current and future generation of youth in order to match the demand of new skills in the jobs of tomorrow? A forward-looking question, Mari, how would you respond to this viewer? Uh, let me give three ideas. I, I think one is for the existing youth who are unemployed or who have just graduated and cannot find jobs. Uh, I think you need accelerated short courses that can get them immediately employed. So I think what uh, was shared earlier, uh, short certificate courses by reputable companies or uh, universities or you know governments that run these programs so that they can get employed uh, quickly and I would say work with the private sector to identify where the needs are. Second, I think uh, vocational and technical uh, training uh, for many, many countries, this remains a very important source of how we can upskill uh, our youth. Uh, but again, uh, uh, you need to make sure that you are doing the, uh, identifying the skills of today, even though it's hard to identify the skills of tomorrow, you do have to uh, anticipate that. And it seems a lot of it is digital uh, related uh, and the use of uh, digital platforms uh, to learn. And I think, uh, what uh, Agustin was mentioning earlier is actually uh, hugely important. The skills are not just the foundational skills or the technical skills. Foundational skills such as reading, writing, and numeracy, and then all the technical skills that you want to upskill. You need socio-emotional skills as well. Uh, so life skills, creative uh, and cri critical thinking, problem uh, learning, problem solving, and active learning. These are also skills uh, that need to be taught. And uh, you know, finally, in the long term, you want to make sure your education system continues to be transformed, transformative, uh, to be able to be fit for purpose, and really thinking about the, the mismatch between supply and demand. Very well said, Mari. And Augustine, let me throw this question to you as well. How can countries match the skills of their youth with employer demand? So the first thing I would say is uh, that we must provide work-based learning. It's not only about training institutions. We can also have work-based learning where the youth can continue learning, like I've mentioned, the CARE program, while they're already working. And these have proved very successfully because on the first day, a learner ends up there, is able to receive ski skills. The other thing I, will wanted, I want to mention about is also for us to review our curriculum. And this I mentioned earlier, colleagues. If we don't review our curriculums, if we are changing our curriculums and we are not changing the teacher in colleges that are trained to handle that curriculum, we're going to be here again a few years discussing about the issue of employment. The two should be intertwined. And then provide labor market information system. What does the market require? You don't have a supply. In this era, is somebody st still training automobile mechanics dealing with the carburetors? We've even moved from EFI. We are not in the VVTI. We have electrical cars. Are we preparing to ask that? So we should have a linkage between what we have. Remember, he said the weatherman. The, the weatherman will forecast what we will require. Education needs to forecast the future skills that we will require. Even if we are facing a pandemic, we have skills that are not just hands-on. We can always do even if we are at home. 
So mine is that we need a linkage between these different players to work on the skills, but ensure that those skills that are missing are recouped during the work. Thank you very much to you and to our distinguished panelists for those great answers. And now as we conclude this panel, we're moving on to something very special for you. A message from Nora Anyadoho from Ghana. Nora was a winner of the World Bank's Youth Act on Education Spoken Word Competition. Now please join me in enjoying her inspiring message and we will be back with the results of the survey. So you ask me, how has education unlocked my potential? Well, look at me, standing here in a small house in Accra, Ghana, yet reaching out with words like tentacles emanating from my being to yours. Look at you through me as we remind each other. We have all it takes on bridle your tongue because education is a fire a spark on a matchstick you a candle i a wick ready to be inflamed to engulf to devour to set things straight because there's no such thing as impossible when you and i have the power to empower through education. Hello, I'm Ruth Moyam in Malcolm, Papua New Guinea, and you're watching the World Bank Group IMF annual meeting. Now, people have been sharing their thoughts of this event online and on social media, and I'm now joined by my colleague, Sri Sridhar, who has been following the conversation throughout. Sri, what has stood out to you? Thanks, Noriana. It's good to see you. Warm welcome to those online and to those of you here in the room today. Great conversation across our online and social media channels from Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. We have people today joining from India, Uganda, Nigeria, France, the United Kingdom, and the United States. And they're using the hashtag for today's event, which is hashtag end learning poverty. And they're talking about the negative impacts of pandemic related school closures, but also the urgent need to focus on effective policies to support a sustained recovery in learning and in skills. So I thought we could quickly take a look at one comment that came in through our Facebook channels. Thought it was a pretty powerful sentiment here from Brian Lawler on Facebook who said, the true wealth of every nation is people. When educated, they can help the whole country advance. Wow, this is so beautifully said. Truly, the wealth of a country is its people. Now, I believe we're owed some drum roll because you have the results of our survey. Remind us again, what was the question we asked the world? Yeah, so today we asked, which policy do you think is most important in addressing COVID-19 learning losses? So taking a look at the screen here, we had five options today. Was it A, to reach every child and keep them in school? B, assess learning levels regularly. C, prioritize teaching the fundamentals. D, increase efficiency of instruction. Or is it E, to develop psychosocial health and well-being? As you can see here, Noriana, all really good options. I had a hard time picking one, but for me, it's all about getting every child in school. So I'm going for A but curious what your pick would be. Oh, this was such a hard one. I mean, keeping children in school, teacher training, uh, psychosocial health and well-being. We heard all these messages right. today. I did pick psychosocial health and well-being as a fundamental block of learning, but let's yeah. see what the rest of the world had to say. Yeah, so let's take a look at the results. And as they come in, just to note, we had over 600 people take part in the poll today. So 21% of people believe that the most important policy is to reach every child and keep them in school. 9% to assess learning levels regularly. 18% to prioritize teaching the fundamentals. 31% to increase the efficiency of instruction. And another 21% here for E to develop the psychosocial health and well-being. So while D does take the majority of votes, I think you and I were onto something here because both of our votes tied for 21%. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sri. Well said and really interesting data and trends here for any policymakers that may be in the audience. This is what people think um, should be top priority. Well, yeah. thank you so much for bringing the online conversation into this room, Sri. Thanks, Noriana. Well, before we close today's event, 
Let's recap some of the key takeaways from the panel discussions. What did we learn? COVID-19 had a devastating impact on education and skills development of children and youth. More than one billion people had their education and training opportunities interrupted. Their loss of human capital not only impacts their futures, it also puts countries' development at risk. Now, to counter this, we heard how countries must prioritize investments to accelerate learning and skills recovery so children and youth can have resilient futures. Now, this brings us to the end of our event today, but there is still more to come during these annual meetings. Please join us tomorrow for a high-level discussion on financing climate action. You can also rewatch this session at live.worldbank.org, and there you will find previous sessions on meeting the financing needs in Ukraine, responding to the food and energy crisis, promoting inclusive growth, and of course, the kickoff discussion between the leaders of the World Bank Group and the IMF on addressing multiple crises in an area of volatility. And as always, do share your comments and thoughts on these meetings using the hashtag ResilientFuture. We hope you've enjoyed all of our distinguished guests today. And please do continue sharing those comments. We really do love hearing from you all. To everyone gathered here at the headquarters of the World Bank Group in Washington, DC, and to all of us joining online, thank you very much.